Well, I'm here with Resonator Slide, Lap Steel, and Steel Guitarist Cindy Cashdollar. Her latest album is called Waltz for Abilene, and it is a really great collection of songs. Some of the songs she composed herself, she's a great composer, and some of them are songs that you might know. And a phenomenal selection of artists joining her, everyone from Sonny Landreth, Marsha Ball, John Sebastian, I could keep on going. <laughs> but uh, this album is a real winner. I've really enjoyed getting a chance to listen to it. So that's always great. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> and to tell you a little more about Cindy Cash Dollar, she's worked with a great number of artists. She played for eight years with Asleep at the Wheel. This led to some collaborations with Willie Nelson, Merle Haggard, Dolly Parton, Lyle Lovett. And as for recording, she's appeared on albums by Van Morrison, Dave Alvin, Bob Dylan, Leon Redbone, Livingston Taylor, Artie Trom, to name but a few. So it's a great, great opportunity to interview you and what a resume you have. Thanks. Yeah, it, uh, it, it, um, it's funny over the years when when I I look at it sometimes from beginning to present it uh it, it's really amazing the the uh, turn of events that lead to each thing and uh, of course being um having the good fortune to work with all these amazing artists you know it, it feels like the ongoing journey is what it feels like in a good way of course you know well, Cindy, what has always been the purpose of the art you create? Um, you know, I didn't really start out with a purpose. When I started out playing, before I got into all things slide, I played regular guitar. I think I started at age 11. And uh, I didn't really feel a purpose, you know. It was, it was something that always seemed to really relax me, number one. Um, it was something that made me really happy, especially after the challenges of learning an instrument kind of started getting less and I could not quite think about what I was doing so much and just play. So those two things were kind of enough for me and I never had, uh, I, I never had it in mind to make a career, make a living out of playing music. It was just something I did, you know, uh, just for my own enjoyment until uh, I started being invited to uh, play out or starting doing some, some very informal jam sessions at a couple of the little bars around here and thought, wow, this, this is really cool. You know, so uh, and then later on, to get back to your question, uh, the purpose became, I think, just to keep enjoying the variety of music that I always enjoyed, even from a very young age. My household had quite a variety of music in it. My dad loved listening to country music on the radio and my mom had, I guess, what would be called world beat music, you know, collection now, but she loved Dave Brubeck, Stan Gatz. She also listened to Ravi Shankar, Ola Chunji. She loved Japanese flute music. So there was quite a variety of music in my house. And so I enjoyed it and always felt that, um, you know, it's out there, but it also kind of all intertwines at some point. Mm. So my purpose kind of became to, to just, to never let that go, to always just keep exploring, exploring and enjoying that. Well, in terms of intertwining, you have definitely succeeded on this Waltz for Abilene album. Anybody who wants to check it out, there is just about every kind of music you can imagine and really, really wonderful stuff from things that you composed, Stephen Foster, there's a Bob Dylan tune. It's it's really interesting. Could you say that there is a part of music that gives you the most joy? Uh, you know, I can't because I think it, it first of all, 
uh, as, as a side person. I think it really depends on the artist that I'm working with. Um, it kind of brings out, brings up things in me, inspiration, ideas, um, and, and that seems to be always of the moment, quite honestly. Um, uh, I, th I think it really depends on that. Uh, with Waltz for Abilene, uh, this project, I wanted to do it uh, with all my friends, you know, old friends. And I've to everybody on the album on Waltz for Abilene, I have uh, spent a number of years c collaborating with, either live or in the studio or both. And so it became a, a musical conversation between us. You know, we knew each other well, personally and in music. And so I felt like all the artists slash friends on the record were, uh, were, were of that, you know, that, that you could um, ha have that joy of uh, just completing each other's musical sentences, you know? Does, hmm. that, make sense? Does that make sense? In yeah. Answer to your question? I think so. Now you have mentioned uh, we've we've mentioned a couple times now Woodstock, which is where you're at now, Woodstock, New York. Could you paint a picture with words? What was it like growing up in Woodstock, New York? Growing up in Woodstock, New York, um, went through many phases. Uh, first, growing up, um, you know, it was it was before the Woodstock Festival, the famed 1969 festival. And so Woodstock's a little tiny village surrounded by the Catskill Mountains. It's very beautiful. Growing up there, um, you know, the shops in town were more of a practical nature. You had an electronics store that sold TVs and radios. And uh, there was a, uh, a shoe repairman, a soda fountain drugstore, a bookstore. You know, it's kind of practical. And then you also had... The artists, you know, a lot of the artists uh, that had uh, had shops with uh, leather making and, and jewelry, but it was nothing uh, touristy. And uh, Woodstock was always kind of a combination of farmers, which my family was, the cash dollar family. Were, uh, my grandparents had a dairy called the Locust Grove Dairy. And uh, my great grandfather was a woodworker, so you had a lot of those local people, and then you had the artists, and so that what was going on. Uh, there was always uh, at that time it seemed like folk music, and there were a lot of parties, and there were um, a lot of pre festivals. Um, you know, getting on to maybe when I was thirteen, uh, they had these festivals called sound outs. And um, outdoors, you know, you could see Paul Butterfield, you know, and all these artists. I think, you know, that was one of the first uh, outdoor concerts I saw. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and gradually as time went on, uh, before the festival, a lot of well-known musicians settled in here, like Van Morrison, Bob Dylan, the band, you know, you're talking mid-late 60s. And so as I got older, um, I was greatly influenced by the music that I heard here and was able to see at a very young age. Nobody carded you. My parents felt totally safe just dropping me off in town hmm. early summer evening, you know, to check out some of the early shows or go to those little sound outs hmm. that I just mentioned. So it always was an area that attracted artists of all kinds. So that was the growing up period. And then when the festival came, it changed. Now, this is maybe a, a long shot, but being that you've, you've, you're from Woodstock, did you know the late Jerome Garfunkel, Art's brother? I didn't. No? No, did he live here? Yeah, he lived in Woodstock. Oh, wow. I, I, I was just wondering. Um, no. Being that you're a dobro player and a, a steel guitar player, are people surprised when they find out you're from New York? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I love your question. Yes. <laughs> no uh, I think there, there used to be that, that TV commercial of long ago for paste picante sauce. And I think that the money line there was New York City. You yeah. Know? <laughs> I mean, people's impression first is either when you say New York, they think New York City or just New York, period. And for some reason, uh, that instrument, uh, as, as well as steel guitar, just does not to seem to connect in people's minds, even <laughs> though there was a lot of bluegrass, uh, you know, here growing up. My, my dad used to, uh, you know, uh, take the tickets at the local uh, sportsman's lodge when they'd have score announces. And there was a, a real blue collar bar here called the Watering Trough that had country jams on weekends and uh, even had some Western swing musicians. So there was a lot of that here. But of course, it doesn't come to mind when you say right. Tobro anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so I always have to clarify, no, not New York City, Catskill Mountains, because Woodstock's two hours new north of New York City. It's really not that far. Would you say there has been a person in music who has helped you the most? I think, you know, there was a few in, in different areas of my um, learning. Uh, you know, first there was my guitar teacher when I was 11, uh, Billy Fair, who was a, a local uh, legend around here that was more known for a banjo player, but he was a great guitar teacher. And uh, actually, Van Morrison, who I um, went on to tour with decades later, was a huge fan of Billy's. So I was fortunate in that sense to have a very good guitar teacher who didn't learn to read music or anything. He was just a patient teacher. Um, and then certainly uh, my Dobro teacher, Charlie Ferrara, uh, he was a big influence. And then later on, uh, Paul Butterfield and Rick Danko, um, you know, I think had the most sage advice to me um, early on, uh, you know, both said the same thing, less is more. They were very hot on that phrase. And it made so much sense, you mm. know, especially with me, you know, around the time that I started playing with them, I had also been playing bluegrass which is, a little, of course, certainly way more busy than what they were doing. And that was an epiphany to, to hear that from them, the importance of, um, you know, Leon Redbone, too, whom I work with. Uh, I, I would say, you know, musically, epiphany-wise, those three people really um, believed in, in the power of the emotion of one note as opposed to a lot of notes, you know, and um, that that I think really um, stayed with me in my heart to, to this day. Hmm. Well, I'm hoping you can tell us about the, the late Leon Redbone, such a, an interesting musician and a unique voice, really made some incredible recordings. What was Leon Redbone, what was he really like? He was a very brilliant man. Um, I've never met somebody so smart in anything. I mean, he was he was a voracious reader of history books, and we're talking all you know old history, dating way way back. The back of the van would always be filled with books of all kinds of historic nature. He was a wonderful uh, chef. He he knew about food. He was a fabulous illustrator, just all around smart guy that also had a great sense of humor. He used to make me laugh so hard, I would be doubled over, you know. So part of the character and persona that people would see on stage was him, the droll sense of humor, the very minimalistic movement. You know, it looked like he really, you know, he, he really had minimal mo movement just to reach for the guitar, you know, <laughs> uh, very relaxed, take your time, you know, that's kind of like what he was, um, very deep thinker. Uh, and, and so a lot of that, I feel, and knowing him personally, did translate to the stage, 
you know. Uh, if you saw him on the street on a day off, he really would not look any different than he looked on stage. Hmm. You know, he may not have a, a tie, but he would have a, a nice, you know, in the summer, a seersucker jacket, nice white pants. I think he he believed in in dressing the way men of many years ago used to dress on a day off, you know. I mean, I remember being in Europe with him, and I forgot where we were. It might have been Belgium, and, and uh, we're standing on the corner waiting across the street, and he's looking around. At, there were a lot of tourists where we were, and he, he said, the fanny pack is the downfall of American men's fashion. <laughs> I mean, he saw stuff like that, you know. But uh, he was also very quirky to work for. He had a lot of rules and regulations that were kind of difficult to, to kind of get used to and remember when I first joined the group. But uh, I, I would just say quirky, sensitive, brilliant would be if I had to sum it up. Really interesting. I was listening to the title track, Waltz for Albaline, this morning, and you composed that song. And I'm curious, how, how do you get a composition going? What, what, what's the process? Well, my process is that there really isn't any, and I only seem to write a song like it's the cicadas, you know, once every so many years or like the locusts, you know, I mean, they come few and far between, but um, so far in a few so songs I've written, they just come to me so fast. I will be in a mood and the melody comes so fast. And, and since I can't write or read music, it's hard for me to write it down. Now that now that there's an iPhone, I can just grab it and put it on voice memo and hum into it, you know. But um, that's how it happens for me. I, I don't really work on those melodies. I, I will work on the arrangement, maybe, and, and think of, gee, who would this sound good with? Um, but for instance, Waltz for Abilene, I was on the road with Garrison Keeler and a Prairie Home Companion. And we were playing in Abilene, Texas. And I always thought that Abilene itself sounded like a musical word. It's so pretty. To me, it just sounds like a, a waltz. And so Garrison used to always like me to do these kind of swinging numbers on the steel. And I didn't want to do that for the show. You know, I felt like I had done enough of those on the show. And so I thought, Abilene, waltz. I want to write a really pretty waltz for this show. The house band's amazing. Alana James from Hot Club of Cowtown was uh, my pal there. We were doing the show together. Beautiful fiddle player. So uh, that melody just came so fast to me, you know. And, and I would like to say too, uh, with the other song on on uh, the Waltz for Halloween album, Salvation, I wanted to write something that was kind of gospel-y, and, and so that melody just came. So I really don't have a process. And because I don't write lyrics, I just feel like a melody has to, I have to have something in my heart that is yearning for the melody. And if I'm really lucky, it comes. Hmm. Well, what about the, can you tell us what composers uh, really of any kind of music, what what composers impress you? I never thought about that. <laughs> um, well, going way back, uh, I love uh, Stephen Foster. Mm. I know that his sons have his songs have be, have been done to death and back. And but I feel that he really was to me one of the original so-called Americana writers. I think some of his melodies are beautiful. Um, yes, yeah, some of the sentiments seem very dated, and of course some of the lyrics seem a, a little dated, you know, if you're, if you're going to take a real close listen. But I've always enjoyed the, uh, the, the emotional of some of his songs, like Hard Times. I think mm. it's 
beautiful song and truly makes me believe that he was feeling very sad and going through and writing about hard times when I heard that song. And of course, there's many different versions. Um, the same with Old Susanna, uh, which is the reason I, I put that on Waltz for Abilene. Um, I just think it's a pretty melody and the instrument that I played it on, I just felt made it into something a little different, but at the same time kept um, kind of the longing or the sentiment, I think that he was trying to convey for the mm -hmm. song. Um, I love, uh, gosh, there's so many, so many composers. Um, I think that of course, Bob Dylan has, has, uh, written, uh, beautiful songs. Um, and, uh, you know, Richard Manuel from the band, hmm. certainly, uh, his songs go right to my heart when I hear them. Uh, he's one of my favorite composers. Roseanne Cash. Um, it's very varied. <laughs> as mm -hmm. you know. Well, you have good taste, that's for certain. <laughs> and I, I was hoping you would mention Stephen Foster. Oh, yeah? Uh, oh. Yeah, I, I, I thought uh, maybe you would, just because you recorded that Susan Foster, or <laughs> Susan, Stephen Foster, excuse me, that Stephen Foster song, which I thought was really interesting, Oh, Susanna. And uh, that's that's why I said Susanna Foster, I guess. But uh, yeah, that was really cool. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I know that there has been tribute, I think a few and, and very well done tribute albums to him. Um, and it's funny, it's to me, I mean, I don't want to get hung up on, on um, the interview with Stephen Foster, but it's funny, it just seems there, there's a, uh, two c kind of camps about that. Either you have the eye rollers, <laughs> you know, when you mentioned Stephen Foster, or you have the people that that love his his songs. So, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I'm not an eye roller. <laughs> okay. well, I didn't think you were. It didn't sound like you were. <laughs> well, uh, also on on this album, people can can check out. There's. Uh, your interpretation of, of one of the standards, Skylark. Mm -hmm. And what do you think about those songs, the, the Great American Songbook? I think they're, they're absolutely gorgeous. I think those, they're like, the melodies are so lush, you mm. know? And, you know, that was a song that uh, I, I, I wondered you know, is, is my, am I biting off more than I can chew by taking on the song? First of all, I'm playing it on a lap steel. Uh, second of all, does it need, what does it need? Does it need a lot? Does, you know, because I, I find a lot of the, the songs from that time um, were, were extremely, uh, like I just said, lush. And, uh, but the melodies are so fantastic, and I, I realized in, in doing that song that uh, I think it was proof that you can really take any instrument and play any song uh, if you really feel it hmm. and, and you have a mind, mind to do it and you want to do it justice. You know, uh, My ex-husband, Frank Campbell, who's a bass player, for years told me that I should do that song. And I always said, what? Crazy? How am I going to do that on a, on a steel, you know, on a lap steel? Um, so uh, I, I just, I was very glad with the, uh, pleased with the way it came out and especially with the musicians that are on that track, I think uh, made it real pretty. I, I wanted it shallow. I, I think to me uh, that there, there's your lush part right there is a cello, you know, <laughs> it's so deep and smooth and it stays out of the way, but um I, I thought that made it really nice. And uh, of course, Floyd Domino on piano and Kevin Smith on bass and Jake Lanley on guitar and Danny Levin. And so, yeah, it, it was uh, a joy to be able to finally uh, do that song. And uh, yeah, I've, I've, I recorded other uh, songs uh, from uh, the Great American Songbook uh, in my work with Manhattan Transfer. So, um, 
it's it's always a, a challenge and a joy when you do it when you finally do it. It's a great recording. Thank you. A lot of people seem to love it, and that makes me very happy. You know, it's kind of the wild card, really, on the album, but I really wanted it in there. Well, this album, you produced yourself. Who would you say has taught you the most about producing? I would say every producer that I have been in the studio with over many years. Um, I, as a side man, I would always, of course, you have to pay attention to the producer, but I would always spend a lot of time observing what they were saying and the engineer, because I always think the recording engineer is the producer a lot of times too. Um, and it was fascinating to me all these years to watch the process up. And in working with so many different ones, I think it finally just by osmosis kind of got there and got me to the point where I thought, well, I can do this. You know, I know exactly what I want to do here. Why, why shouldn't I produce this? You know, why shouldn't I be the one, pick out the songs, gather all the musicians, you know, do, do everything that one has to do. And it is quite a job to take on as well as making music. But I just felt like the right thing to do at this point. Because with my first album slideshow, uh, I had a producer, but I ended up doing a lot of the work myself anyway. So it was just easier, in a sense. Easier in a sense to just say, all right, I'll do it. I'm hoping you can tell us also about your collaborations and your friendship with Sonny Landreth. He's been on this show a couple of times and every time he's been on, it's, it's created quite a, quite a ruckus. He's a ruckus, isn't he? <laughs> he? He's a walking, breathing ruckus in the sweetest of ways. I mean, he's, uh, he, he, I believe I, I, I'm a huge fan of Sonny's and um, collaboration. I met Sonny the first year, within the first year that I was touring with Asleep at the Wheel. So that would have been 1993. And uh, Sonny was, we were, both of us were playing in Seattle. And uh, Asleep at the Wheel finished their set uh, kind of early. And Ray Benson, the band leader, knew that I was a Sonny Landworth freak. So we took a taxi and raced across town to catch Sonny's last song at his show. And I got to meet Sonny afterwards. And that was a thrill for me. And then uh, some years later, I think maybe 2001, um, was on a recording session with him. Uh, it was for the Cajun band Beausoleil was doing a all instrumental CD called uh, and so that was very thrilling to be able to actually sit there in the studio and collaborate with, with slide parts with, with uh, someone who I was just over the moon crazy about their playing. And then we toured with Bows Away on their 25th anniversary tour. So that's when we started playing together. And then I, um, and then he was on a track on my first album, Slideshow. And, uh, then subsequently over the years, we tour together every year as a duet. And, uh, and then he, of course, landed up on this new album. Uh, he's amazing. Um, he's so soulful. He has, as you know, such a unique style of playing. I mean, you really, even if I'm listening to the radio, I think in four bars of a song, I can tell it's him. There's mm. just... Nobody else that plays guitar like him. Very true. And a very kind, sweet, generous person. Too. Hmm. I can I can believe that. He he's been very nice every time I've encountered yes. him. I, I just remembered this one time I was interviewing um Kenny Gradney from Little Feet backstage, and I was asking him about Sonny Landreth uh when he would sit in with Little Feet. And this was years ago, but I still remember what he said. He said, it's always like there's a train on the stage 
<laughs> and there, there, there's a train coming, and its name is Sonny Landry. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> and it really, it, you know when it pulls into the station, but you don't want it to leave, you know? Yeah. <laughs> That's a great description. I'm going to remember that one. <laughs> One of the tracks on on the Waltz for Abilene album. I'm hoping you can tell us the 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 songwriter of this particular track. He's going to be turning 80 in just a, a couple weeks now. Ring them bells. What inspired you to choose that particular Dylan tune? Well, um, actually, there was a couple of, of tracks on this album where the artist chose the songs. And that was an instance where, uh, in, in that case, it was Amy Helm uh, singing that song, doing the vocal on that song. Because I don't sing, so I had a few people, uh, guests on the album for singers. But she chose that song. And, uh, you know, we, we kind of wanted to do a little uh, homage to, to Woodstock. And, and as I mentioned before, and as most people know, Dylan lived here and wrote here. So it's kind of a, a two for one in the choice of that song. Um, she sings it just beautifully. It just, it still kills me every time I, I hear it. And um, so that's how that came about. She just wanted, she thought that would be nice for I wanted something to to play dobro on because uh, on every track I'm I'm playing a different type of slide instrument, but uh, I wanted to do something with her where I was playing dobro, so uh, or as the politically correct term is now, resonator guitar. Uh huh. <laughs> so that's how that came about. And we have uh, Brian Isaacs from the Lumineers uh, playing bass and singing on that song. And uh, our good friend Zach Janikian uh, playing mandolin, and Amy's playing mandola on there. Can you tell us about your your recollections of working with the producer Daniel Lanois? Mm -hmm. uh, for well, the only time I've I've worked uh, with 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 Dan uh, as producer is, is for Dylan's Time Out of Mind record and. You know, it was really interesting. Uh, you know that that song, that album was recorded live, and the portion of recordings that I did were at Criteria Studio in Miami. So, you know, we're in this huge kind of cavernous studio, and um, you know, there's a lot of everything that's cut live. So there's so many musicians there, and my first impression of Daniel was. It just like as a as a a ringmaster at a circus, you know, he was kind of standing in the middle. We were all set up in a semicircle, you know. Dylan's to my right, um, Jim Keltner set up right across from me. Tony Garnier is over here on the left, and on it went. And I just kind of saw him just kind of spinning around the room. You know, saying, okay, now we're, we're going to go here with this. Here's where we're going with the song, you know. And that's kind of what it, it seemed like he was just really like quickly giving direction because it was live. There really was no time. Nobody, we weren't sitting there, you know, spending hours getting sounds on our instruments, you know, or, you know, laboring over parts and who was going to play backup. They just, they just, you know, hit the record button and literally you went, you heard Dylan go over the song once or twice and then you started recording. So that's pretty much, I think, what Daniel was doing, at least for the portion of uh, the album that I saw, was just really just very quickly, you know, um, just kind of uh, trying to, to um, you know, ready, set, go and finish and okay, let's go hear the track, you know. Um, and, and offer suggestions, uh, you know, don't play that much, to which sometimes Dylan would say, well, no, I, I think that they should play whatever they want. So there was some, some uh -huh. um, you know, differences of opinion um, during the recordings I was there. But um, I, I think Daniel had, I think his vision for Time Out of Mind was great. And I think he accomplished 
in both uh, the integrity and in sound, the, the recording sound, just like the studio. It's amazing. You know, it, it doesn't happen that much. When, when I got the, the album in the mail and put it on, I, I was immediate. I got chills. I felt like I was in the Criteria Studio room again. It sounds exactly like that room. And I know it was how Daniel went around also uh, miking things, you know, or saying, uh, don't worry about getting a different sound on that mic. Just just take it away from, from your amp and put it on your dobro. So there's a lot of audio suggestion uh, from him, too. Hmm. What did you think about, uh, you know, the, there's been so much said about that album, especially because of the book Chronicles, where Dylan wrote about that I think he mentioned your name in the book, didn't he? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. What, 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 what did you think about um, what what he had to say? Because you know, it does seem, as you said, there that he he illustrated this friction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, actually, if you could jolt my memory by what he did say because I did read the book and I've also read a couple other books and interviews so is there one certain um, point that comes to your mind that you would like to share with me so we can have a little discussion <laughs> on that? Well it seemed like what he was saying was that um, they they couldn't they couldn't come to they couldn't come to an uh, understanding always they couldn't come to an agreement, I guess you could say, but that it seemed like he really respected Lanois nonetheless. Yes, I would agree with that. Hmm. I would totally agree with that. And, um, you know, it's, it's really, to me, it was a situation of, of two alpha musicians. Ah. <laughs> that you have two very special people, two very gifted people in music. And um, to see, you know, to, to see uh, or get the vibe as to what Dylan was, would try to convey at times as to what he wanted. And then you could see what Daniel wanted to do. And yeah, the, the, it, it, it did not always meet in the middle. I mean, you know, as far as I observed, there was like no knockdown, drag out fights or yelling <laughs> or anything, at least that I saw. But there was some friction and tension, of course, you know, and it was a, it was a large project. And uh, I, of course, Bob had a certain vision and sound in his head, as did Daniel Lenoir. And I think at times there was clashes. There was a lot going on there. You mm. had two of every instrument. You know, you, you just had, um, you know, you, you just had people all playing together at once, trying to feel what everyone else was feeling at the same time. We were all set up as close together as you can be without a lot of bleed into each other's microphones, you know. But, um, yeah, there, there, was, uh, there were times where, where you could feel the friction, you mm. know. And I think that's also why I kind of pictured at times just sitting there watching as Daniel had been this ringleader, you know, hmm. with a whip just trying to reel it all in, you know. Has there been a compliment that you've received through the years that has meant the most to you? Hmm. I'd have to think about that one. I think that's a great question, and I, I just can't think of one. I mean, I, I when I'm called to work with people that I love and admire, to me that's always a compliment. I feel like I'm complimented all the time, just in that sense, you know, that that people like my sound and therefore want to work with me. Um, so I feel complimented all the time like that. And I know what you mean, and it's a great question, but I just can't think of any one thing. You know, I mean, the only one that sticks out that's kind of funny is uh, when I was in my 20s uh, in John Harold Bluegrass Band, uh, you know, doing the bluegrass festivals. And uh, I was coming back from the stage, and 
one of the uh, one of the you know the diehard bluegrass players. It might have been somebody from can't remember. It's a well-established bluegrass band. He said, uh, "What's a, what's a girl doing playing that thing?" And he said, you, "You sound like a man when you play." And I thought, okay. I could get really pissed off at this, or I could take it as a compliment. And I thought, you know what? This is a compliment. Huh. I will take playing like a man as a compliment. And I've never forgotten that particular thing. It wasn't, <laughs> it's a roundabout answer to your question, but that was, you know, the first compliment offhand it to me that, that really hit home. Hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. Well, when when you release something like this album, Waltz for Abilene, or anything that you you know that you've done, do do you pay attention to the reviews, like the critical reviews of of um, music writers, whether they like it or or whatever? Is it something that matters? It is definitely, especially since. I don't know. I was going to say, especially since this is only my second album. Mm -hmm. And then I immediately thought, as I just said that to you, well, what's the difference whether you put out one out every year or you put out one every 14 years? The fact that remains is that you can be hurt by the negatives or upset because the reviewer just did not get what you were trying to do or love the fact that they did get what you were trying to do. Um, I read every review and um, I will say I, I didn't read any, there weren't any things that hurt my feelings with this Waltz for Abilene and I thought it was all very sweet and very favorable. Mm -hmm. And if I could remember any of the compliments from those reviews, I would quote them to you right now, but I can't. But uh, I think people just seemed to get it and were very um, favorable. I just, I just can't recall a negative and I'm, I'm sure there was one or two, there always is, you know, but um, I do pay attention because even though something might anger you, I think you can always learn or take mm. it into consideration. And it's also kind of a good way to, you know, um, if I, sometimes I will look at the writer and go, oh, okay, I'm going to look, look up what else they've reviewed and see if this is a common th thread, you know, do they not get certain things? Mm. I think a lot of times, you know, when people don't like something, yeah, you can either not like it, it's not your thing, you think it's silly, you think it's not sincere, or just didn't understand what was going on, you know. And unfortunately, when you do something, you know, that's that's what you're subject to. But, um, yeah, I, I have every review. I sign up for Google Alert, <laughs> so every, every review, review that comes along, there it is. You know, did you read re the reviews at all? Yeah, they were all great, as as, as expected. Um, Thank you. <laughs> well, when somebody goes to see you perform, or when they're listening to one of these, one, one of the records, mm -hmm. what do you want somebody who is checking out your music? What do you, what is it you want them to take away from that? What do you want them to get from the experience of listening? I would hope that um, they feel something. I would hope that when I play a solo, um, which is usually with other people, <laughs> although some shows I will, you know, um, do one of, one of my compositions. I would I would hope that it it stirs up some emotion in them, whether it makes them sad. Um, or um, makes them just makes them feel renewed or just happy at that moment, you know? Um, because I know myself when I go out to hear live music, I literally get goosebumps sometimes hmm. when I listen to people sing or play. And it could just be one sentence, one phrase, one solo. But sometimes it just really gets me in my heart 
or like I said, the goosebumps. And, and that's what I hope that, uh, and I think any musician would hope that, to, hmm. to convey, you hope the emotion that you're feeling as you're playing will come out and, and kiss somebody else, you know, in, in that sense. Um, and it's also too, it's nice to, to influence people. I love it when people come up and say, you know, I've always wanted to learn how to play lap steel. I always want to learn how to play one of those things, a, you know, resonator, you know? Do you think I could do it? I play a little guitar. But that's always great too, when you also influence people just musically, maybe maybe they want to, you know, take up an instrument. So it's, it's a good feeling, but, but that's what I hope. So what is coming up in the future for Cindy Cash Dollar? Well, the pandemic future is a, <laughs> is a <laughs> tough one, isn't it? I don't know. Uh, so many things were canceled last year. And uh, hmm. so another good question. Um, it's, it's funny, I, John Sebastian, who, who is a very good friend and neighbor, called this morning just wanting to have somebody's phone number. And he said, what are you doing? And I told him that I was going to be doing an interview with you. And he said, well, he said, here's the good questions. We can, we can always hope for the good questions. And so, yes, you have provided good questions <laughs> on this interview. And, and this is one of them. What's coming up? Hard to know uh, with the pandemic. Uh, there are some fun shows coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, finally, things are opening up. Um, am I going to do another CD? Hasn't even entered my mind mm -hmm. uh, yet. Um, uh, I might collaborate. Uh, Arlen Roth, uh, who is also on the Waltz for Abilene record, uh, recently emailed and asked if I would like to do a Christmas record with him. So that might be on the table. But um, other than that, uh, there really are no projects that I have in mind right now. There's there's just gigs coming up. Well, one with my uh, Austin bandmate Johnny Nicholas is coming here. We're doing a little Northeast tour soon, and then Asleep at the Wheel. Uh, I'm uh, subbing for their steel player, so uh, I'm going to do a Northeast tour with them. Um, I'm doing a. Uh, the annual Bob Dylan Bash that happens here every year in Woodstock that benefits a couple of, of uh, things. Uh, so I'm working in collaboration with Happy Traum on that. And, um, and uh, just, just uh, did a session for the Goo Goo Dolls new album. And uh, that's about it. I don't really have any plans beyond... I thought actually that I would be touring with Sonny Landreth as we usually do in November. Uh, but that won't be happening until early 2022. So I don't know. I, I think what I'll be doing is just keep uh, organizing and sorting through posters and pictures <laughs> and memorabilia and, uh, you know, maybe uh, fixing up some pedal boards and, you know, getting some, some, some gear in order uh, in anticipation of when things open up again. But uh, really... Uh, I don't have any plans to uh, to learn any new instruments or anything. <laughs> oh, I know a lot of people are doing that. Yeah. But oh, yeah. I haven't, I haven't done that. Always in my mind. It's always a nice fantasy, you know, but I just never get around to doing it. I was even going to take lessons online. I thought, well, maybe I'll take some, uh, you know, resophonic lessons, you know. But um, <laughs> I uh, just haven't haven't done it yet it's been quite a break actually this whole year from playing it's been odd for all of us you know taking a break from playing music so well i'll tell you it's a small world because it was maybe oh i don't know about five minutes before we started this interview i got an email from happy trom <laughs> oh, <wow>. okay <laughs> interesting just like that? Are you, uh, do you, are you uh, maybe going to interview Happy? Yeah, I was trying to track him down, and I, I sent him an email a couple weeks ago, and I didn't hear anything. And then right before we started, I got a beep on my phone. I thought, oh, there's Happy. 
Wow, let's see the Woodstock lines. They're all coming to you today. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> I, just, I just did some work on uh, his new recording for him, too, last week. But uh, he's, he's a great guy. He's an old, dear friend and uh, certainly has has brought music to the people all these years with homespun tapes. I don't know of any instrument that you cannot learn on homespun from homespun tapes. Hmm. So he's he's great, you know. But, well, uh, he's working hard. He's a hard worker too. <laughs> but we've been uh, we've been we're we're looking forward to having dinner together soon. Nice. We all have a lot of time. I mean, the other. <laughs> The other thing, actually, I was planning on doing this summer is um, I uh, there is a uh, farm animal sanctuary uh, nearby that I am a, a supporter of, the Catskill Animal Sanctuary, and they rescue abused and abandoned farm animals. So I am looking towards just going there to, now that I have all this time, uh, just to volunteer services for whatever's, whatever is needed there on a daily basis. You know, prepping food or mucking stalls or whatever, but it's a, it's a very beautiful, uh, impressive operation that, that saves uh, a lot of animals that are in, in dire need of uh, help and uh, attention. So I'm kind of looking forward to doing that. Different things, you know. Um, they have people come and play music in the barn for the animals sometimes, so maybe I'll do that too. Interesting. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, I always, I always like to end the show as a, a kind of open forum. So for any of your fans out there, for anybody who's watching or, or listening, what would you say to anybody who's tuned in? I would say that uh, we are very lucky to... Um, to be able to have the opportunity to hear shows such as yours to keep our sanity <laughs> because I truly believe that people like yourself and uh, all the people that have been working throughout the pandemic to to bring music music and, and thought, things to make us think, things to make us happy. Uh, we're very lucky to have that so I thank you for being one of those people. and. Uh, I would say to um, even though this has been a tough time, things are opening up and, uh, you know, use this as a time if you have any time. I know working moms at home, people like that probably don't, <laughs> but uh, it's been a great opportunity, I think, this year to, to look inward and uh, release things outward that a lot of us have always wanted to do and have never had the... Uh, never had the time to do it. So I think it's been a yin yang kind of year, the good and the bad, you know, mm. but, uh, I have been trying to appreciate both some way. And I would also say to everybody, keep the faith because we're getting there, you know, or as Sonny Lando that we says, we're going to make it. I think we are going to make it. Mm -hmm. I really do. So uh, I would encourage, I would encourage everybody to get vaccinated and uh, just hope that uh, when things open up, we're all going to have a great time, regardless of what it is. Hmm. Well, thank you for the uplifting words. And uh, I, I will tell you one thing before we go. It was a couple years ago, and I had seen your name on, on album liner notes and stuff. But I had finished doing an interview with, with Kinky Friedman. Oh, yeah. And we were off the air, and he said... Have you ever thought about getting people on your show like Augie Myers and Cindy Cashdollar, people like that? And I said, well, I, 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 you know, I was, I didn't know that much. And, I, and he was like, you ought to do, you ought to get people like that on there. Thanks, Kinky. Thank so, you. So <laughs> you can thank him for this. That's so nice. I have not seen Kinky in a long time, but thank you, Kinky. I appreciate that. And Augie Myers, wow. He's, 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 he is great. Love Auden. So, well, thank you so much, Paul, for having me. I My pleasure. A wonderful show. I love, speaking of variety, as I said before, I love variety in music. You have the most amazing variety 
of people on your show, and I'm very honored to be one of them. So thank, thank you for you. having me. I really appreciate it. My thank pleasure. You. All right. All right. Well, until next time. Until next time or until I'm in your neighborhood playing with oh, someone. That would be uh, great. I'll, I'll either uh, I'll hear you or I'll see you or both. <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks Well, a thank lot. you so much. Right. You take care of yourself. And you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.